right, so Alice, let's start with you. When were you born and where? I was born in Kent City, Michigan, on September 10th, 1937. And what was your maiden name? Heltzel, H-E-L-S-E-L. -E -E so it was Mary... No, Alice, uh, Alice? Ann Heltzel. Alice Ann. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And Paul, how about you? Okay, my name is Paul J. Morrissey, second in the generation here in Comstock Park in Belmont area. Uh, born April 24th, 1936, to Paul V. and Rose Morrissey, uh, who moved into the area out of Finley, Ohio. Okay. Um, and Alice, where were your family from? Well, Grand Rapids, I guess, say. Eh? My father was Norris. And my mother was Lois Helson. Okay. And, and they they, came, they started their fruit farm in Kent City. Oh, okay. So they moved from Grand Rapids to Kent City? Yes. They're both they were both born in Grand Rapids. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's kind of interesting so to move from 17 the seventeen mile and Sparta Avenue. That's where I lived, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. To move from the city to the country to start a farm. What what was their thought about that? Uh well apparently my grandpa purchased a farm in Kent City for my for my dad to run and so my dad then married my mom and moved up there and then uh, I'm the oldest of five children so we grew up no cows pigs just fruit <laughs> so, okay yes, was, was that fruit farm. apples or apples cherries plums few peaches um, had a couple apricot trees but basically apples. Ah, I didn't know all those fruits would grow here. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Paul, how about your family's background? Uh, my family has always been in, in sales for farm equipment. Uh, Dad was a graduate ag engineer out of Eames, Iowa, Iowa State. Worked for Cater Caterpillar for a while and came up into this area selling Caterpillar tractors for Caterpillar and John Bean sprayers to the orchards up in the, up in the ridge. Um, they moved up here in 1932, uh, married my mother from Finley, and set up business here during the Depression when he was laid off from Caterpillar. He was here and he liked the area, so he opened a store here in Comstock Park. Well, that was brave to do during the Depression. Very much so. He received a little severance pay in merchandise, and he took that up onto the ridge and demonstrated it and sold a few Caterpillar tractors that way, and that got him started. Oh, that's remarkable. So um, tell me a little bit about what you remember about your parents. What kind of people were they? And you want to start, Alice? In what way? <laughs> <laughs> How would you describe them? Loving. My dad hugged everybody. Um, great dad, hard worker. It's hard to be a farmer. So I'm very in tune with the weather nowadays because he was always looking at the weather. Could he spray the crops, couldn't he? Could you pick today with things ripe? Um, that's the way I grew up. Um, mother, being a city girl, um, took her well, I think, to be a farmer's wife. But uh, she was always working, always canning, cooking, sewing. Um, but mother had a book. The house could burn down. She loved to read. She didn't hear anything. She had her book. <laughs> Other than that, um, great parents. Absolutely great parents. Yep. That's great. Lucky. Yep. And our parents knew each other. We were raised basically the same, so that helped a lot. Interesting. Okay. Paul, how did your parents know her parents? Well, my dad was a salesman for the farm equipment, and her dad was the purchaser of the farm equipment. I see. So that's how we ended up meeting. Uh, my dad got together with her dad at one of the horticultural shows in Grand Rapids uh, after we were both out of school, and they decided that we should meet. <laughs> so he, they set up a a demonstration, so I would demonstrate a garden tractor. She's one to mow the lawn. So I took a garden tractor up there, not knowing that it was her day off, and 
and demonstrated the garden tractor to her because she's the one that mows. True. Yeah. 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 We didn't know a thing about this. I had no idea. And she, her mother invited me in for lunch, which she never does to a, for a salesman. <laughs> and I asked her out for a date that Friday night. And because you're That's history. So <laughs> I went up as a salesman and she was the farmer's daughter. So <laughs> that's, that's the way it started and that's the way it worked out. And yeah. That was 56 years ago? Seven. 57 <laughs> years, yeah. I've dated for about a year. Yeah. My yeah. gosh, what a great story. <laughs> that's a great yeah. story. So Paul, once you realized, you know, and kind of tie this into how you felt about your dad, I mean, was I take it you didn't resent what he had done, but it was this kind no, of his no. style, or no, no, that actually it was more my mother's style. It just so happened that those two men got together at the right time, and we must have been the topic of their conversation <laughs> that day. But that's usually my mother does all of the fixing up. Yeah, but it was the dads. Yeah, and uh, as I say, I was that's after I took over the business. And uh, Dad was kind of working for me at that time. Uh, and so tell me a little bit more about his character. What kind of a man was he, and, and your mom as well? What Dad, attracted her? Well, Dad was what I would call a gentle Irishman. He was a gentleman and an Irishman. And he met his rose, his wild Irish rose, uh, his fraternity blind date. Mm -hmm. Um, and he always said that he wanted to marry a, an Irish Catholic girl. It had to be both. And he did. He found her. And he's a very good man. Uh, ran his business correctly. Started his business in 32. In a little tiny store called the Stowell House. Stovall House, which was the American Legion Hall in Comstock Park. Uh, Campbell Lumber was on one side of it, and he was on the other side of it with Morrissey Equipment, Morrissey Farm and Garden Equipment. No, Morrissey Farm and Orchard Supply at that time. Do you have a picture of it? This is Morrissey Farm and Orchard Supply. Yeah. So you're right this is the first one. The very first one. Okay. Um, and he had that store until about 36, then he, the tannery in Comstock Park, the Union Tannery, or Grand Rapids Leather Company, they're known as both, uh, went completely out because of the Depression. And it was a great opportunity, he bought it. it took him a while, but he bought the whole system, all of the buildings, and ran his business out of there from 1936 until about 65. Wow. Then the road came through, the highway came through, and took and that out. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Okay. So let's let's um, take just a moment to think about your family as a whole. Um, what about your siblings? Did they all stay locally here, or what? What? What uh, pathway did the rest of your future follow? Um, rest of your family follow. My brother um, lives in Kent City. Yep. Yeah. So does my sister. My other brother lives in Marne, and I have a brother in Wisconsin. And he and I are 17 years apart. Oh my. So, so he's my, my baby brother. Um, Paul's got, you go ahead with your siblings here. Uh, I have three sisters and no brothers. Yeah. So I was the only one that went into the family business. And uh, my oldest sister is here in town, been a church organist. All her life, still is. Um, married Dick Grant. Uh, then my youngest sister is still in town here, Jean Earhart. Um, raised a family here. And my middle sister is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Married to a gentleman in finance. All doing very well. That's great. So let's let's talk for just a minute about why you made the decisions that you did and your siblings did not. So for example, Paul, you had three sisters. You were the logical choice to run your dad's company. Did you always want that? Or was, did, was that expected? Uh, kind of both. <laughs> That's kind a good question. It was, uh, 
expected. My dad always wanted me to go into business with him. And I went to school at Michigan State uh, in agricultural engineering, just like he did at Iowa State. Uh, gave us a good background with the equipment engineering part of it so we could understand the principles of it. But I didn't think that I would go into the garden equipment as much as I did. Um, thought I would continue the farm part of it. But it just worked out that I liked the garden end of it. So my business turned into the garden equipment and my dad worked for me all the rest of his life until he was 89. Your mother, your mother and my did. mother worked in the business <laughs> as well. Oh my gosh. She did the uh, lot of the bookkeeping and banking for us and kept things running. And Alice, what about your family? Now, you were not asked to take over the farm? My brother, my oldest brother, had it for a while, but it wasn't something he wanted. He didn't like it. Um, so he became the head mechanic of the Kent City Schools bus mechanic. Red did that for years and years. Uh, my sister married a fellow who lived in Kent City. They're still there. My other brother, the next younger brother, was this counselor um, for children with cancer for a while. He did that. And then my younger brother in Wisconsin, um, he went to Michigan Tech got a job ending up in Wisconsin. So he's an engineer of vibrations and sound isolation. Oh right. my goodness. Yeah. Doctor of engineering yeah. with uh, Mercury inboard IOs and, and then, then Harley, Harley, Harley Davidson, Davidson. <laughs> in the Davidson plant. Yeah. Did, doing very well. Retired now. Spread around. Yeah. Did it hurt you to give up the family farm? Well, not really. The horses it did. I had, yeah. <laughs> she always had horses. I had horses. She had to give those up. Gave that up when I married Paul, but that's okay. I mean, <laughs> my sister took over the horses. Um, I was kind of sad when they tore the house down. That was sad. And we happened to go by. Uh, see, it's 20 miles away, but we happened to just go by on the day they were tearing the house down. The outbuildings are still there, but I think because I've been married quite a while before all that happened, it was okay. And it was an old wreck of a house by that time. So, yeah, that must have been a shock to drive by. And it see. was a shock. It really was. My goodness. Yeah. Well, okay, so we've talked briefly a little bit about um, where you were educated. Um, tell me a little bit about your experience of attending school. And we can start with you this time, Paul. You started um, Catholic school? Well, I started in uh, North Park Kindergarten, first grade at Fairmont on Oakwood in North End of Grand Rapids. Dad had moved into the city by that time. Uh, so we lived in the North End. And then St. Alphonsus, Blessed Sacrament, first eighth grade class of Blessed Sacrament. Uh, and then Catholic Central and then on to University of Detroit and Michigan State. And so faith was an important part of your education? Oh yes. Oh yes, always has been. Still is. So tell me a little bit about that. What was it like to go to those schools? You always hear these terrible stories about the nuns and the... <laughs> so you have any zingers about any of those experiences? <laughs> about the only zinger I had was the shock I had when they all came out to our cottage at Bostrick Lake in big black swimming suits. <laughs> That's about the only real shocker I had. But, uh, normal Catholic people. education, strict education, uh, good education. Um, they gave me a good foundation. And then at uh, University of Detroit, that was a Jesuit school, is a Jesuit school. Um, but they didn't have anything for agricultural engineering, so I transferred to state. But somewhere along the line, you, you became interested in electrical engineering or whatever inspired your experiments. Oh, the, the electric car stuff? That was just um, an engineering fun part. Um, I developed a, my own little electric car, uh, VW, which we called the Volkswagen instead of the Volkswagen. <laughs> That's clever. Uh, with batteries in the front and back and a, uh, actually a electric motor out of a rototiller, 
we were selling the General Electric garden tractor, electric garden tractor at the time. So I used that motor to propel the vehicle. And then later took on an electric car to sell it out of Sebring, Florida. And we sold quite a few of those, the Sebring Vanguard. But I always uh, liked anything mechanical, so it was just a normal thing. Electrical was easy, so mm. work with that. We'll come back to that. Um, Alice, how about you? What was your educational experience? Well, I started out in Kent City, and then for the second grade, half of the second grade, I came to Mount Mercy Academy, make my first communion, because there was no Catholic school or church. The closest church was Holy Trinity, which is, you know, outskirts of Grand Rapids. Then back to Kent City until the ninth grade, I went back to Mount Mercy again to try to, I was a boarder there, go to school, but I didn't like it. So I came back to Kent City for 10, 11, 12th grade. Um, and then I did not go to college. I went to an airline school and I wanted to work for the airlines, which I did. I always wanted to travel. And then met Paul and got married and the rest is... is that was easy. a great thing because with her, her working with United at the time, we got to fly to Hawaii for our honeymoon. <laughs> for very little money. You paid the tax. Yeah, you paid the it. tax to fly and that was about it. It was oh, wonderful. Fantastic. Yes, yes. it was. Yes. So we've been traveling ever since. Yep. Not why I married her, but it was <laughs> a nice <laughs> perk. <laughs> okay, um, so let's let's uh, linger in your, your growing up period for a time. Let's uh, share, if you would, some of your favorite memories. What were some of the kid things that you did? For me? Or no, I'll start with you, sure. I had a horse at that time, an old horse. My, always, my dad promised me a horse when I was 10, and he said I got to be 10 very fast. So I had a lot of memories riding the horse. What was your horse's name? The first horse was Donald Duck. <laughs> Why? I, he came that way, just Donald Duck, an old big horse that was old and slow and wouldn't hurt the kids. Um, and then I had a couple more horses along the way. Um, just growing up on a farm I thought was wonderful. I thought the city kids didn't have anything to do because the farm kids always had something to do. Um, well, being the oldest I did a lot of babysitting. I helped my mother, of course. I don't know, it was just a great life. Did you have a chore you hated though? Oh, uh, cleaning the house on Saturday morning. That wasn't my favorite. Um, another thing, I didn't mind it, but my mother washed her hair and I always had to put it up in rollers for her. Uh, that was a given. Uh, I don't know. I guess I always cut the grass. I like to cut the grass. So, of course, that helped meet him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I just had a fun, you know, it was just a fun time. How about you, Paul? Ours was kind of the other way around. I always wonder why, what the farm people well, what did all did. way out in the country and <laughs> nothing to do because the city you had all kinds of things going, foxholes and and bicycles and sports and foxholes. What's that? Well, we're always digging foxholes. Um, I don't know. I dug many of them. You dig a big hole in the ground and make walls and put a top over it and and then go have lunch in there. Just play. That was one of the things. Nowadays, that probably wouldn't yeah. do. And school stuff was always games going on the playground. Uh, mumbly Peg. Uh, what is Mumbly Peg, anyway? Mumbly Peg is, back then you could take a jackknife to school. We always have a jackknife in our high top pocket. And Mumbly Peg was flipping a jackknife into the ground and making it stick. So you do it from your shoe top and your knee and your shoulder and that's a guy thing. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> Our school must not have done that. And then of course the old Duncan Yo-Yo. Uh, just games all the time, eeny on you over and uh, all kinds of games. And then uh, uh, using croquet mallets for uh, playing soccer, or not soccer, but uh, 
like polo on our bikes. The, That's you know, clever. Yeah, <laughs> and then wrecking the bikes and building them up again and uh, always things to do. But always things to do. You were doing this with guys, not with your sisters. No, mostly guys. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah, and then Boy Scouting. Um, we had a, a summer cottage that we did a lot of stuff out there all summer long. Um, what was your reference there with the black bathing suits? I didn't... <laughs> that was when the nuns came out from Catholic Central. That was when I was in high school. They came out for an outing. My parents invited them out um, just for a nice outing. And I didn't expect them to be out and go swimming <laughs> because they were Dominican nuns down there. Um, but they had their full-length black swimming suits. And the way they go out, and they had a great time out there in the lake. <laughs> Just, I guess, not a picture I thought I would see. Yeah, I'm trying to imagine that. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> it's bringing back a funny memory. <laughs> well, that's but, a great uh, one. Yeah, a great bunch of gals too, and I just never thought of it that way. I think of them as school teachers and rapping us on the knuckle when we do something wrong. Oh, so that's not a myth then? No, no. <laughs> no, that's not that. Nuns were always very strict and very grateful for it. We needed it. <laughs> I imagine you did. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about how were you introduced to the world of work. And let's start with you, Paul. It might seem an easy transition for you, and then Alice, you can think about that, okay? okay. Well, mine was very young, of course, because Dad had a business. And so as soon as I could be a sweeper, or a weed picker or whatever over at the store, he would take me over on Saturdays and and I'd clean the bathrooms and sweep the floors and do whatever, so it was just a natural for me to be right in the business. And then uh, when I was old enough to drive, I'd, in this in this tannery building that he had since 1936, the uh, soil around it was all muck, and so there was not a good well. You couldn't get good water out of there. The tannery always took the water for their tanning out of the river. But the muck didn't make a good well, so we had to go get drinking water. We went over to the Lamro Well on West River, a five-gallon jug, and at 14 or 15, I'd take the company truck and drive it over and fill up that big jug of water, take it over to drink. Because the water that came out of the well was brown, and that wasn't good drinking. Out of the, not the well, but out uh, of the well. In the yeah, it's an artesian well that came out of the Green Ridge Hill mm -hmm. on West River Road. There's found out today there's still a marker there that says be careful of the wet pavement because the water still goes across West River, mm -hmm. right where North North Park Street comes into West River Road. A little bit south of there was where the artesian well was. Just a pipe coming out of the out of the side of the hill and a stone building, a little stone shed there, open sides, and that was called Lamrose Well. So that's where we got our drinking water. So you never minded being... Oh no, no, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, it introduced me into the store and you get all kinds of stories from that, but um, I enjoyed it. And then as I worked there in the summer, got more into the help selling a little bit, and working in the shop, whatever I could do. Were you paid at the time? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, minimum wage, I think 35 cents an hour. <laughs> Worked good. <laughs> wow. I think it was 35 cents an hour back then, was minimum wage. Did you save up for something? Probably not. <laughs> Coke for a nickel so I could, I could get plenty of Coke to drink. Okay. How about you, Alice? Um, being Gosh. the oldest, well, first, I think the first thing I remember doing is driving the tractor for my dad. You know, he put in the lowest gear there was, and then he'd spray the trees, um, or... Riding on the sprayer. He, yes, he rode on the sprayer. I drove. I, that's one of the early memories. Another one was an early memory when they grew potatoes, and he'd get me in the truck and I'd steer, 
and they'd throw the potatoes on the back of the truck and would come to a corner and then he'd run up, turn the truck around for me and I'd steer all the way down. <laughs> Early memory doing that and then um, the first time I got paid was like 50 cents a bushel but we picked up drops off the ground. So I did a lot of that, picking up drops. Um, then one year I spent thinning peach trees. Um, just always something to do though, driving the tractor, that's how I learned to drive. In the car my mother took me out on the road, she taught me how to drive, but I already kind of knew how to steer and brake and those kind of things because of the tractors. Um, so as far as a job, and then my first real true job was working for the airlines. That's so, quite a leap to go was. from driving a tractor to... <laughs> how did you ever think about that? I love to travel. It was something I wanted to do, and they had airline schools at that time, which was out in Hartford, Connecticut. So I guess I did a correspondence through the mail, and then a friend and I, first time we were ever on an airplane, was um, 56 or 7. We flew to New York and then on to Hartford, stayed there six or eight weeks, learned airline things, and then I got a job in um, Chicago with TWA. I wasn't old enough to be a stewardess or anything, so I had to be a teletype operator, which there isn't even such a thing anymore. But I did, that's my first real paying job. What is a teletype operator? <laughs> Just because nobody knows anymore. Uh, you typed out a, when you typed, holes became in a paper, a small paper, and you, a tape, and you fed the tape through a machine, which translated into words. I guess if I say that correctly. So we fed that, we typed up the people's names. Now this is in downtown Grand Rapids at the Keeler building. Typed the names up on this paper, these dots, holes in the paper. Went out to the airport that told them uh, what the passengers who were boarding the plane. And then by, by the time I left working, uh, the computers had just started to come in. Mm -hmm. And that time I worked in reservations. So, and that, so I was in on that transition. That's interesting too, but at what point then did you fly? Was it after those things? I or? never was a stewardess. Oh, you didn't get to be a stewardess? I didn't get, mm -hmm. No, I decided I'm, I could fly all I wanted to by being in reservations. And then... And I had, you had to be 21 at that time to be a stewardess, and I wasn't 21 yet. Uh, I was 23 when I met Paul. Um, should I tell him what you said to me? <laughs> <laughs> Are you old enough to drink, he said. <laughs> That's when I asked her out on that Friday that night. first or, date. <laughs> on Wednesday, I had, Asked me, she says, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I don't know, are you old enough to drink? <laughs> <laughs> I remember. So we went to a movie and then went for a cocktail afterwards. Distinctly saying, well, I am 23. <laughs> <laughs> you looked young. <laughs> I did. So that was our first date, though. But anyway, then uh, I continued to work to the airlines until our oldest daughter. Um, by that time, the airlines had departed Grand Rapids, mm. all the small offices closed. So that worked just fine for us because I was pregnant for our oldest daughter. And so then I became a stay-at-home mom. Okay. Um, now you've already talked about how you met each other and um, your first date. So tell me, how did Paul propose to you? Oh, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we went I think actually to somebody somebody's uh, party or something, but he wanted to leave. I thought that was kind of crazy, so he drove to my parents' yard, and he reached beside behind the seat, pulled out this beautiful diamond. I'm crying and crying and crying. Ran into my mom. I'm even crying now. <laughs> showed my aunt was in town. Showed everybody. Ran down the road. Showed my cousins, aunts and uncles. Drove down there to show them. Got back. I'm following around through all these introductions. Getting hugs and all that stuff. Got back in the car and he said, well, I she never, never answered. I never answered. <laughs> <laughs> Asked her to marry me and she got all excited and 
we ended up in the house and in the other house and down the road and back and time for me to go back home. And I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, that's great. How long had you been dating by then? About a year. Yeah, but I don't even know that long. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, got married in February, the okay. next year, uh, because that was my slow time in the, at work. <laughs> you should have heard my, my mother. Yeah. February. She said, well, when are you going to get married, honey? Well, I said, we're going to get married. She said, when? I said, February. February! <laughs> because cold and snow and all those kind of things. Not the time to get married. No, not in February in Michigan. But oh, I, did. I didn't do much in the, in the winter. I uh, sold snow throwers, but by then, you were all done and you said, do nothing. So it was a great time for honeymoon. And we could go south or we would end up in Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, where it's nice and warm and mm -hmm been great because every year we've gone an anniversary thing, it's nice weather, other places. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so, um, and you have four children now? Mm -hmm. Okay, and how did you approach child rearing? Read Dr. Spock's book. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Spock, I don't know, I, I was thrilled to. Yeah, we were very happy to have the children. We were a little older when we got married. Most of our friends were already married. I was 24, he was 25, so we were happy to have children. We were ready. Yeah, we were ready, and um, I don't know. Did you ever disagree about anything? Oh, sure. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be married all these years not to disagree about something. We raised a redhead, and so there was always a little dispute going on there. She was a very active child. She's the one, that's, she's now a veterinarian. But she's our youngest. She's the youngest, yeah. yeah. So we went to Dr. Dobson's. We did. Uh, classes on that and how to raise a strong-willed child. Mm -hmm. So he taught us a lot about raising our strong-willed daughter. And she, they all turned out very well. We have two of them are engineers and two of them are doctors. Wonderful. Doctor so, of English and a doctor of veterinary medicine. What was the secret to raising a strong-willed child? <laughs> The, the best advice we had was feed her, love her, and she'll grow up fine. And she did. And leave her alone. <laughs> you had to pay money for that, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just good advice. Um, and we did. I would argue with her tooth and nail, and, and Alice would get after me, but we still look back on those days as that was fun, that was good. He thought it was. Yeah, and so did she. <laughs> yeah. does. What were your biggest arguments with her about? Oh, what she can and can't do. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose. I don't know. She just, when you're strong-willed, you're just... Yeah. Curfews she, and... You know, she was going to do it her way, and, and she's now probably on her third business, running three at one time in <laughs> veterinary medicine. She grew up. Yeah. She said she was a late bloomer, and that's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. She admits that. She you gotta hang, around you gotta hang in and, there. <laughs> and she flunked out of her first few years in college, and and one, then she one got year. one year. Yeah. And she then decided what she really wanted to do, and from then on, no stopping. <laughs> she did it, but you gotta be yeah. strong. She parent, made it into vet parent, school. Parent these kids. So. Yeah. We just, yeah. They all turn out okay. For the most part, these kids that give you problems turn out just fine. What do you think is um, the difference between your your methods of child rearing and what you hear about child rearing nowadays? Well, Have you heard much about it? We spanked. <laughs> yeah. They don't do that. They don't sit them in a corner. We, uh, I suppose we were heavy air handed. Well, one of our daughters has never straight. spanked her child, and what we did. Of course, they're reared different now. They sleep on their back and all these other new rules that we don't know about. But, um, I don't know. Those kids are turning out okay, though? Sure. Oh, they're fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, their children are doing very well. We have eight grandchildren. Um, we always thought that the engineering way, we had two boys and two girls. Now we have four boys and four girls for the... <laughs> 
grandchildren. <laughs> Everything balanced. Yeah, balanced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all balanced. Got to do it the engineering way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no now, idea how. You've been together, you said, 57 years? Married. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So let's talk about some of the significant history that you've lived through. Um, let's start locally here. Uh, well, no, let's start more broadly. So you came through the Depression. What's mm -hmm. parents. Your parents did. Parents did, yes. We were, well, actually we were born in the Depression mm -hmm. in the mid-30s, um, 36 and 37, but we didn't know it. Our, our recollection started in the World War II time, mm -hmm. 40, 41. Um, what are some of your reflections about that period? Do you remember much at all? Mm -hmm. Well, luckily we're both but we are not from military backgrounds because my dad was in the agricultural business mm -hmm. and it was necessary to have them here and her parents were in the Farmers. growing farm business so they didn't have, didn't have to go into the war. But we remember certain things, like the butter you... Oh, the rationing. The rationing. Yeah, we remember those things. Um, and you had a victory garden? He did. We had a victory garden in Grand Rapids, and we, my business sold a lot of, my dad at that time, sold a lot of garden tractors for these little victory gardens. It kept us very, very busy. He was the first simplicity dealer in the, in the country. The first, the first dealer was my dad. How did that happen? Uh, the owner of Simplicity in Wisconsin had a contract with Montgomery Ward to make garden tractors just for them under the Garden Mark name. But he wanted to expand his business. The war was limiting what he could do. So he came around into Michigan looking for a distribution point for his garden equipment, private labeling, calling it simplicity, and Dad had this great big tannery warehouse, so he approached Dad to take on a hundred garden tractors at one time. He had even a railroad siding that he could bring them in, and so Dad said okay. He didn't have to pay for them. The owner said, well, I'll bring you a hundred garden tractors. He'll help sell them to other dealers around. But Dad started right in selling them immediately for the Victory Gardens. And we've been a dealer from then right on until we closed with Simplicity. Mm -hmm. Honored a couple of times for being the first dealer. Mm -hmm. And that was, again, part of the war effort. But the war effort was funny because we, we did things in the city, the blackouts, the air raid warnings and the air raid drills. Uh, Dad was a uh, civil defense volunteer. He had to go out and make sure all the blinds were closed during the air raid so that the cities wouldn't show up up in the air just in case they have a, have a bombing, which of course luckily we never did. But that was all war stuff, rationing. We'd go collect grease, uh, bacon grease and cooking grease to take up to the meat markets and they would turn it in for the war effort, collect papers, collect metal. Uh, that was a city thing. All part of the war effort. So we started in the back in that era doing that. What was it like when the war ended? My dad rang the bell. My dad rang the dinner bell. That part I can remember. But other than that, I suppose, I don't remember really. VE Day was in the summer, and uh, we were out the lake, and the church bells were ringing out there, and horns honking and so forth. Mm -hmm. I don't remember VJ Day, when that was. I remember when it was. I remember the paper, but I don't remember the day. It's like anything else, you have something big happening, you know where you were and what you were doing, and, and the cheering and the ringing of the bells. Because we were only nine, eight mm -hmm. years old or You were so. kids. Yeah, we were kids. Yeah. Well, What's 45. the next big historical event you remember? Well, Kennedy? The one, yeah, Kennedy's... You know where you were when Kennedy was Kennedy. 
What was the singer's name? Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, landing on the moon. True. Those kind of things you remember exactly where you were and what you were doing, what you were watching. Were you always working when these things happened? I was when the uh, Twin Towers were hit. We heard that first hit on that one on the radio. And so we turned the television on. I was working, I had sold my business at that time and working for a competitor. And we turned the TV on and then saw the second tower get hit. Um, then they knew that it was a sabotage. But going back, I guess, we were first married was when Marilyn Monroe died and then Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what else. It would be so outstanding we remember where we were except the Twin Towers. How did you uh, how did you help your kids get through moments like that? Were they very upset? With what? Which one? With the news? Yeah, with what was happening on the news. Well, about the only one that we had children would be way back in the Twin Towers time. And they were kind of young at that time. I don't really remember. Hmm. I don't either. I don't, we don't remember having a problem with it. We're talking about it. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Maybe they were off in college or something. I... Okay. No, don't remember that. Um, so let's go now a little bit more closer to home. Um, when you first came to Comstock Park and you're in the business and you're inheriting from your father, not probably inheriting, you're sort of working your way in, what was Comstock Park like back then? Uh, my first recollection is in the early 40s. The stories from him go back to when he first started and the, the fairgrounds were there when he first opened his business on Four Mile and West River. Um, it was just a little tiny store like I started over on Plainfield. His store in Comstock Park was quite small. The Stovall building, the American Legion Hall at the time. American Legion was upstairs and Dad was had half of the downstairs and the other half of the downstairs in this one was uh, Campbell Lumber. That's in this building. Oh, okay. And that's kind of right across the street from where the fairgrounds were. This building shows that. This is the bank building, but the fairgrounds were over here. Um, there was a, a flood back in 34, I think. Um, he outgrew that in about 36, and at that time the Union Tannery became available because of the Depression. It had been closed for several years, late 20s it closed, and they were liquidating, so he bought the entire Union Tannery grounds, mm -hmm. which went from Nick Fink's store there on Lamro all the way out to about the parking lot of the Fifth Third Ballpark. Mm -hmm. That whole stretch was the tannery. A lot of buildings, including houses. The uh, first school in Comstock Park was part of that property. It was owned by the tannery. Uh, they built it for the school, for the tannery people, and then other people in the park. And about six houses along West River were all part of the tannery. He sold those relatively soon to help pay for his buying of the tannery. And he kept the tannery row, they called it, and rented those houses out. And there's some quips about that property that is that are kind of fun. One of them is that the, the whole area along there was muck. From West River Road to the river was kind of a flood area. Every year, every year, every year flooded with debris and then it settled down and it was just plain muck. So they couldn't build much of anything on it. That's why it stayed vacant so long. And Dad's building was built on piers. It went all the way down to basically bedrock. It was just solid ground, but we called it bedrock, about 11 feet through muck. And the other buildings on the property were built on inverted um, concrete slabs so that it would stay rigid. And all those buildings were built that way except for the big tannery. 
building, the big hide storage building, which they had to keep dry. Um, they had fires in the muck, which people don't realize can happen. Hit lightning hits, and the the wood down in the muck catches on fire, and it just smolders, and smoke comes up out of the ground. I remember those uh, when they when they went through with the with the road. The 131 went right through my dad's building, so all that had to be torn down, and all that muck had to be dug up and sand put in to support the road firmly. And that's where the big hill went from uh, from Nick Fink's house, which was right across the street. Great big hill that was all used for the sand, along with some of Lookout Park in Grand Rapids. But when they pulled the, the big tannery building out and all those pillars were down there, they pulled them up about 11 foot deep, four by four, concrete. There's 120 of them holding that building up. And they buried them closer to the river, which was the state property. And they ran into them years later when they tried to build a parking lot for the and put light posts up for the uh, fifth third ballpark. They ran into buried concrete and had no idea what it was. So I, they looked me up and I told them what it was. So they anchored the lights to their old cement piers. Um, they had mined wood out of that area. There was, instead of tanks above ground, which they stored water in, in metal tanks for the tanning process, they also stored acid in a building out behind the store, ground level, but that was in wood. They built wood boxes, um, probably twice the size of our living room here, out of oak, oak planks, 20 feet long, 18 feet long, big square tanks with several layers of wood, all the way down, all the way across the bottom, and a couple layers deep. So when those were all gone, the buildings were all gone, that wood was still in the ground. So Dad found it and dug it up, had some of these guys dig it up, and they sold it to the furniture companies. So he mined wood <laughs> out of the ground. Your dad sounds Very hard amazing. To do. <laughs> those are a couple of the quips from back then. Okay. All right. So uh, take us through the sequence of your businesses. Okay, um, Dad was the starter of the business, Paul V. Um, and he named me Paul J, so we wouldn't be exactly the same, but all through business, that was always a problem. You want to talk to Paul Sr., Paul Jr. Dad's business started in 32 at the Stowell business, or the Stowell building, which I think I mentioned was Campbell Lumber on one side and Dad on the other. And upstairs was the, actually was a, meeting room and a dance hall for Fred Lamro's band. Um, I don't know how often they used it, but it was this, the main building for the uh, American Legion Hall. And the American Legion Hall now is on that same property. Um, and Dad lived in one of the houses up on top of that hill. And he moved on out further on West River, and that's where I was born. Uh, about the time that he moved into the big building uh, at the tannery. That's yeah. the tannery building, actually the end of the tannery building when the road went through. You can see the, the road, the, uh, that's 131 Expressway, and the north ribbon went right through Dad's front door. So that's when it took the building out and all the pillars had to, or all the pylons had to be moved. And this building then was tore down, and that was the last of the buildings of the Union Tannery, or the Grand Rapids Leather, they call it. Then we moved, uh, my dad stayed in a smaller building off of the property there, and sold chainsaws and did chainsaw repairs while I went across the river with the garden equipment. And our first building was in the Mandler Wood Products, which was right next to where the Plainfield Lumber building is. That's closed now, but that was right near Four Mile Road. 
very, very small business and we just wanted to keep the business going, keep serving the customers and do some service work. We outgrew that in about a year. Now this is, we're over there all this time while they're building the road because we kept some property and we wanted to put the main building back in Comstock Park. So this was a temporary thing. Then we moved out or south of there to the expressway and rented this building, which is right in front of Mr. President's motel across from the Plainfield Plaza. It's no longer there. This was uh, owned by Marv Clapp, a doctor in the area. Stayed there for about two years. That's where I was when I met Alice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to show her my business. <laughs> and when I took the tractor from there up to see her. Um, then we moved back north a little ways across from, at that time, the Miracle Mart, uh, where Tony Benton Ford is, right across the street from Tony Benton Ford, was this building. It was called the Pier Marine, owned by Corky Helms. Rented that from him for about two years. And at that time, the road was completed and we could move back to the property. So I had the business built by the Klein brothers in Comstock Park again, right on West River Road, 4050 West River, and that's this building. It is now the home of uh, Outback Fence Company. That was the building that I built, and we stayed there until uh, 1990. 1990, I sold it to a, another firm, and they ran it for a little while, and then sold it to Outback Fence, probably in 92 or 93. And I went to work for, a, for Granville Tractor, when I basically retired from business, but I couldn't sit still, so I went out and worked for Granville Tractor for a few years, and then retired from there. So that's kind of the sequence of my businesses. Um, tell me a little bit about the, um, there's a news article that you showed me with your dad holding an auction when you had to close the business. That was in about 1965 or six when the road bought the business. He closed it up, and they had a... 65. Yeah, we built in 68, so it probably was 60, well, I think 64, day. 65 that Dad sold his. And they had a big, big auction there, and made the, made the paper the, the closing of a pretty good-sized business. And Dad had a lot of antique things and drew a big crowd for that auction. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the church, the moving of the church in Assumption. Oh yes, uh, when we moved out into, well when we first got married we attended the Assumption Parish in the old church on Belmont Road and built a new one to help work on that and then uh, tore down the old church. I moved a lot of the old windows and so forth into the new building and just plain tore down the old one. Why did they do that? Uh, had to close it down for several reasons. Mainly the fire department wouldn't let us use the balcony anymore. Mm -hmm. The uh, foundation was crumbling way back when they moved the church from St. Isidore's. No? Adelbert. St. Adelbert's, Adelbert's on the right. west side. Adelbert's. It's where that church came from when they built their minor basilica there. The old church was t torn apart, moved out to Belmont by wagons, and reassembled there in the fall, in the winter. And so when they put in the stone foundation, it wasn't that, that well built, I guess, and it started to crumble. And the walls in the church were starting to give a little bit. It's getting old and way too small for the congregation. And we hated to lose it. It's uh, very similar to the parish out at Parnell, a big old wooden structure, nice building, but it had to go. Okay. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to do a little bit more delving into was this invention of an electric car, because it seems to me that you were prescient in a way. You were looking forward into the future, even if this was <laughs> something that was just kind of um, an interesting challenge for you. What were you thinking? Well, it certainly wasn't revolutionary because electric cars came before the, the gas cars. But I just 
wanted to do it. it just took the old VW chassis and took the, the engine out of it, put batteries, six batteries in the back of it and six batteries in the front. And the charger was down in the very nose of it, so I could just plug it in at night. And we took it to church quite often and I'd go back and forth to work. And then when the electric cars started coming out in the mid-70s, um, straight electric cars like a golf cart, um, they came and approached me to take it on. So I was very happy to do it. I loved it. Um, one little quip on that one. Coming home from church, uh, we had company. My roommate from Michigan State was from Panama City, Panama. He was riding with us on a visit coming back from church in the electric car and he was in the back seat in the middle and Alice and I were in the front and I think all three of the kids were probably with us or three of the four of them and it was quite a load in that vehicle and coming up the hill and they were leaning back against two wires that were close to each other and they were getting hot and when the when all that current going through there it's like an arc welder when you're working with DC the wires fused together and sparks just flew and the smoke filled the car. And we're coming up this hill trying to get to the top of the hill. <laughs> and the guy, my roommate in the back, was the first one out of the vehicle. <laughs> he thought he was going to die. So <laughs> he went, I think, out the window. <laughs> he walked home from there. It was only about a half mile left. And I got in the back and pulled the two wires apart. And I think most of them walked home. See, yeah, I think we did too. <laughs> we got very far away. So it's just one of those things where it was too much current for the insulation that was on the battery, and somehow the wires got crossed behind the seat. <laughs> but so that, that was one of the laughed about that for yeah. years. So, but the cars never took off, right? Well, they, these well, the, the, these took off for a while. We sold quite a few of them. And why? What uh, what was the advantage of them? Well, the advantage was in, in the mid '70s was an oil crisis. The gasoline prices went sky high, so it was just a, a time for an electric car experiment. And these, because they were like golf carts, um, you just drove them so far, and then you had to plug them in. There was no recouping the electricity unless you went downhill, and the pulling back of the motors put current into the batteries, but it was a losing proposition in that way. But we sold quite a few of them. There's still a few of them around. I wish I had one. Uh, you use it for a golf cart. I'd love to see one. We should ask if anybody's yeah. still got uh, one. If you, if you go online and, and uh, put in Sebring Vanguard City Car, or just City Car, Electric Car, C-I-T-I-C-A-R, uh, it'll come up. And it'll tell you the whole story about it. Uh, they're made in Sebring, Florida. And we, as I say, we sold quite a few of them. One government bought. Well, Lansing was a little bit miffed about it because they weren't really street legal according to their specs. Mm -hmm. Didn't have side protection. Uh, no, this is back a ways. Uh, so they, wanted, they bought two of them from me, which I was delighted. Um, it took them over to the Lansing proving testing facilities, and they never came up with a reason why they couldn't. So I sold two cars <laughs> to them, and I don't know what happened to those. So we we've, we've tried quite a few different things over our business life: uh, go karts, mini bikes, snowmobiles, electric cars, electric garden tractors. And it seemed like everything that we got into ended up being race things. The, the go-karts ended up being high-powered and race things. The snowmobiles, they wanted to race snowmobiles. <laughs> the tra uh, tractor races. The tractors and garden tractors, they went into garden tractor racing. But it always seemed to spoil the, the field that we were trying to have just fun with, especially mini bikes and go-karts, because that was a kid thing. And uh, they wanted to race them always. So we had fun with a lot of new things throughout the life. How do you look at the community now? How it's changed since you first put down your roots here 
And how do you feel about that? Well, the nice part is it's old and so are we. <laughs> so we grew up with it. It's changed and so have we. Um, how has it changed? Still. Buildings. Yeah, of course, all the old buildings are gone. Um, I don't know. The uh, Life is different. We look at things different. Uh, politics is certainly different. Um, technology. But, yeah, technology is completely different. We mm -hmm. had a certainly a much, much simpler, safer life than what children have now. Um, mm -hmm. She went around the world by herself before we got married with her airline school and um, I used to take bike trips and and cross country trips. We just go out and do it. We can't you can't do that anymore. You think it's not safe anymore? It's just not safe, no. Well, it's <laughs> people are different. Um, I guess we just lived in a easier life. What do you think has been the biggest technological change? Well the Technology. Yeah. Technology. <coughs> Can you know would, the handheld things of our yeah. children? We never even dreamed of such a thing. We just got we back from a trip coming from south to north and going through Washington, D.C., and we never even looked at a map. We just listened to a gal telling us where to go. Yeah. And if, we, if I could have had that, you know, 70 years ago, that would have been great. But uh, that kind of technology That's is good. That's great. That's good. That's great. What, do, uh, what pleases you the most about the changes you've noticed so far? Well, Life is easier. Uh, everybody's got a phone. You get yeah. car trouble, you just call somebody. We've never had that before. We're certainly connected better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so that's better. I like the fact that we have free phone calls long distance. That's a nice thing. <laughs> Don't have to say, hang up the phone, you're costing too much money. <laughs> that's, and that's, the way that's long did. distance. <laughs> that's the way we definitely grew up. Now we call our friends in Panama or wherever and it's the same and there's no charge. Um, no, I just think... Uh, Life is much more expensive now, but we're making a lot more money. Hmm. So it, that's relative. Uh, so, but my you 35 mentioned cents an hour is a lot different than it is now at 10 or 11 dollars an hour. To start. Minimum wage. Minimum wage. Yeah. Yes. But you mentioned that you uh, you think it's less safe now. Does that worry you about uh, what kids are growing up with and people are dealing with nowadays? I mean, you did live through the Cold War. Yes. Um, they're, I would say, used to it. They're, they think about it. And so they're as safe now, I guess, as we were then. We didn't have to think about it. Every generation thinks it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. The, yeah, the good old days is different to each generation. Um, but they're, they live in that world, we live in that world, and so we're used to thinking about protecting ourselves well, differently than when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I walked to school. I actually walked more home from school a mile and a half all by myself. You couldn't do that now. Uphill both ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so just speculate a little bit about what you think has been your most significant contribution to your community in all the years that you've lived here. Volunteer work, that type of thing. Oh, boy. I'm the mother that volunteered at school for many things. Um, I still volunteer at um, Spectrum Health. Um, as well, we built the church. You built we went the through church. the gamut uh, of doing what we what we were supposed to be doing, I guess, in each section. We helped build the church. We were home and school active, president of that, and so forth. Um, we were active in each section of our kids' school life, home and school association. Um, I think we're just playing active. Yeah, we just <laughs> did what needed to be done at that time. Now we're helping with the grandkids and supporting them. 
traveling. Okay. So yeah, we travel a lot. Well, luckily he likes to travel, or so do I, so that, that's nice. Um, All right, well, next question. Um, I'd like you, if you can, talk about what, what was the dream you had for your future when you were younger, and how did it turn out? You wanted two stores. You were going to have two stores. Oh, yeah. That's one thing. And 12 kids. Yeah, well. <laughs> 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 I guess the <laughs> closest thing to that was our bucket list. We would, True. We each made up a bucket list of what we wanted to see or what we wanted to do, what what we wanted to see in the States and out of the country, and, and we pretty much done all of what we wanted to do. When you were first married, you did that? Uh, basically. I think you were. We were both travelers. We were. But one of the things that he was, you thought you would have a, um, another business somewhere like your dad did. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, branch out, maybe, Branch out. Which I never did. That and was one thing. quite grateful I never did, because yeah. you get too far extended and that's not good. But with our bucket list, we Put down what we want to see, what we want to do, and then we do it. Find so, a way. Find a way to do it. Uh -huh. Would you say um, what you've enjoyed most about your life and what advice you would give to any future generations? Take it as it comes along. And when it's time to downsize, downsize. When it's time to have kids, have kids. Each, each part of it is great. Each part of it's fulfilling. Uh, we've always had travel in between, either with the kids or since the kids have gone, <laughs> or they're out on their own. We uh, never took them to anything educational, though. We took them to all the theme parks, rode the roller coasters. <laughs> and <laughs> did the fun things. Did the fun things, yeah. They love that. Yep, so we've just plain enjoyed life. Well, it sounds like it. And we're healthy. That's the most important. We're both healthy. And that is critically. It is. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered most everything on here. For us old people, we're doing pretty good. Yeah. Uh, my dad enjoyed the uh, activities really around the war, war time. Uh, he raised chickens for, to feed us, um, which a lot of people did. Um, yeah, I think we covered most of all of this. Okay. Well, you took so much time to prepare it for me, I wanted to make sure that we didn't miss oh. anything. <laughs> and I must say, it has just been the greatest pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so very much for well, everything for you shared us. and for everything you contributed, because you've obviously been hugely important to this community. And I'm sure everyone is very grateful, or certainly will be once they see this. <laughs> well, it's kind of fun That's to think fun. about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but back in the, because my dad, it be Jim Robinette's dad. Yeah. Well, yeah, both our dads knew Robinette's. But my dad and Jim Robinette's dad would go to market in Detroit, all our apples. Oh, okay. Detroit market. My dad and Jim Robinette's dad would go take their trucks to market in Detroit and with, sell with apples. loads of apples. Apples, basically apples. Once I rode with Dad, and on the way the lights went out of the truck, I'll never forget that. In the middle, because the, they left in the middle of the night to get to market by six o'clock in Detroit when markets open, and the lights went out, probably around Ionia or someplace. And Dad stopped the truck, got out, did something, the lights went back on. Way we went. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> now, what you could do there. I was nice. probably a 12 or 13, I suppose. <laughs> okay, so let's mention just briefly that um, you were an Eagle Scout. Yes, I made Eagle Scout uh, back in 54. Uh, Love scouting did, it seemed like all my life, scouting, along with Nick Fink, the fourth or fifth, several others in the area. But we have a granddaughter now that's uh, in the Scouts. Not the Boy Scouts or not the Girl Scouts, but she's in the American Scouts. So I'm going to talk to her about being the first girl Eagle Scout. See if we can. <laughs> now this is the one that's the. Uh, yeah, the strong-willed child. So she <laughs> Another one. might do it. <laughs> she might do it, and we yeah. have a, a granddaughter that's Eagle. Well, she's Girl Scout Gold, 
which is the equivalent of a Boy Scout Eagle Scout. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So she's Girl Scout Girl. No. So, and she's uh, in college at, at, uh, at uh, Duke University, and she's in the uh, fraternity. Oh, no, she was in the fraternity in the school before that, but so she has fraternity brothers that are girls. So it, <laughs> it's all getting mixed up, but we love it. Yeah. It's kind of fun to yeah. do things. Sure. It, it Part is. of the new world. Yeah.